praise your name. I will praise your name. When times of need carry on, I will praise your name. I will praise your name. Though darkness falls all around, I will praise your name. I will praise your name. If I forget what I found, I will praise your name. I will praise your name. Hallelujah. Let Lord Jesus Christ shine forth. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, tonight, I do have um, Tony Costa with, with me, and we will be going through um, Jordan Peterson's uh, video about his message to church. Um, peace of Christ be with you, brother. How are you? I'm well, and peace of Christ be with you, sister. And I'm doing very well by God's grace, and I'm really glad to be with you tonight. So thank you very much for joining us all the way from Canada. I am in the future, you are in the past. And all I can say is 
we don't need to be afraid about future. Jesus holds everything. So That's someone right. from future is giving you that advice. Um, Tony, in case um, people don't know you, would you be kind enough just introduce yourself to us, who you are, what do you do, and then we take it from there. Sure. I'm uh, I'm Tony Costa. I'm from Toronto, Canada. And um, so I am uh, both involved in pastoral ministry. I'm, I'm involved in the church. And I'm also an academic. So I teach at various seminaries uh, here in Canada, and uh, including uh, teaching uh, as an instructor with the University of Toronto. And I speak at various lectures in the areas of apologetics and um, various conferences, um, various events that promote the defense of the Christian faith, including Islam and, and answering Islam and how to debate Muslims and so forth. And I've also been involved in uh, debating with Muslims. I have a, a debate coming up next month with uh, Nadir Ahmed uh, on uh, is Muhammad mentioned in the Bible. So uh, that's my area. I've been involved for in apologetics for about 30 plus years. Um, so that's my calling and, uh, that's where the Lord has, uh, has placed me. Um, thank you very much. I must say your debate is going to be painful a little bit, but anyway. Yeah, no, yeah, but I believe no pain, no gain. So, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. And the gentleman you are debating, he desperately in need of Lord Jesus Christ. Absolutely. Also, um, you've got books as well. Would you like to tell us about the books you have? Yes. Um, well, my most my most recent book is is called Early Christian Creeds and Hymns, and it's uh, what the earliest Christians uh, believed in word and song. And so this book goes through the, uh, the the creeds that are in the Bible, in the New Testament and the Old Testament, and it also talks about the songs that are in the New Testament text. A lot of folks don't know this, but there are hymns inside the the text of the New Testament that early Christians would have sung. Uh, the most famous one is the Carmen Christi, uh, which is found in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 11. Um, so what this book does is it looks at these hymns. It also looks at these creeds like Jesus is Lord, uh, creeds uh, like uh, Jesus is the, is the Christ, the Messiah. What does that mean? What are the ramifications of that? And so it's a very, it's it's a compact book. It's very rich in theology it's it's readable though it's not written in an overly academic um uh, academic level and so it's it's really given to the to the lay person to read and understand my other book here this this one's a little more academic this one is called uh worship and the risen jesus in the pauline letters um and so this one here is is a lot more academic it was written it's my doctoral it's actually my doctoral dissertation that I wrote. Um, so it, it's, it's again, a little more academic. And so it's, it's, it's more geared for, for those uh, who are familiar with Hebrew, Greek and, and systematic theology and so forth. Yeah. And both of the books helps us to uh, be more confident in our faith. So thank you very much for. Yes. Yes. Well. I do have a new book coming out. I'm actually writing a new book. I'm hoping oh. that it'll be out. Well, it'll probably be g given over to the publishers at the end of this year. Hopefully, God willing, next year. It's called No King But Christ, and it's a book written on the collapse of 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 spirit of worldviews uh, against the the worldview of the Bible and so forth. So it'll deal with topics from uh, social justice to morality, and uh, it's a it's a book that deals has a more wide a wide spectrum. Okay, uh, well, once that comes out, we will go through it. So thank sure. you. Um, so, Tony, uh, on Friday, I had a live stream and um, maybe Thursday it was. Last week, I had a live stream with um, Jai Apologetics and Daughter of Christ. We went, through, uh, we went through a video which was message to Muslims. And today, um, I ask you if you can join me so we can, we can go through uh, Jordan Peterson video, his message to the Christian church. Um, so in your busy schedule, I'm grateful that you make time for us to join us. So my plan is, if that's okay with you, mm -hmm. uh, I'll play. So video altogether is like uh, 10 minutes, something. I'll play a little bit of video and then we pause and then we talk about it. Sure. And those of you who are joining us in the live chat, if you want to get our attention and then make a comment, what has been said, please put at sign in front of DCCI ministries and then we will plug that in as well. Um, 
Are we ready? Sure. Sure. Okay. So if you want me to pause in any moment, just let me sure. know. Otherwise, I'll just pause whenever I think it's good. I haven't watched the video because I find those videos painful. I'll go to go through the pain once instead of twice. So sure. To dare to write. Hi all. It is, of course, completely presumptuous of me to dare to write and broadcast a video entitled Message to the Christian Churches, but I'm going to do it anyway because I have something to say and because that something needs to be said. I want to pause it, uh, Hatun. I've been speaking to and... Yeah, and yeah, he's, he had exactly the same start on the message yeah. to Muslims. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I just wanted to start by saying, if you notice, he he feels a little presumptuous that that he's going to address this issue to the to to the Christian Church, and the the major problem with that is is again that um, Jordan Peterson is, as far as we know, is not a Christian, and he's not a member of the body of Christ. The Church is the body of Christ, and the Church is submissive to her head, her King, her Lord, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the, the one thing I just want to point out here is that the Bible is very clear that the church is not to receive directives or instructions from the world. The church is, once again, an organism. It's the body of Christ, and Christ has appointed. It says that he, he gave apostles and prophets and pastors and evangelists and teachers and so forth to build up his church and to edify the church. So... It is those who are within the body of Christ, who, who have the Holy Spirit, um, who are appointed by Christ to be the shepherds of God's flock. Now, what, what Peterson is doing is he's, he's looking at this from the outside. He's looking through the window from the outside. He's not an insider. And there's a passage of scripture, I, I just want to bring this up, that I think is very important to our discussion. And it's found in, in 1 Corinthians 6, where the Apostle Paul is dealing with the subject of Christians who are taking each other to court, to the tribunals. And Paul rebukes them for not dealing with the issues of the church amongst themselves. Instead of going to the outside, going to secular authorities to have the secular authorities tell you how to run your situation, your life. Uh, so 1 Corinthians 6, even though he's talking about... Um, lawsuits here. This is very applicable to what I just need to say. Uh, so 1 Corinthians 6, he says, why, when one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of to the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. It, can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle dispute between the brothers? So notice he says that we are not to take instructions or advice from those who have no standing in the church. Now, now Jordan Peterson um, uses a lot of religious language. He, he, he's going to talk about these lectures he did in Toronto on the book of Genesis. But the problem is that Jordan Peterson is reading them as a psychologist. He's reading them from a very secular point of view. And so the body of Christ is not just some institution. It's not like a, an organization like uh, with a CEO at the top. The church is not an organization. The church is a living organism. It is alive. It is made up of living men and women born again of the Holy Spirit of God, who are alive, and who are organically connected to Jesus Christ. And God has given us his word to tell us how we ought to live. And so what Peterson does here is he gives you some advice and some moral directives, but you're going to notice something very strange in this video. Not once does he mention the name Jesus or Christ. Not once. And so um, as we're going to hear, this is a, a very a very secular uh, very um, secular, very basic level uh, advice that Peterson has given. Very worldly message to a uh, body of Christ. Yeah. Okay, let's continue. Watching and listening to audiences all over the Western world for the past four years. 
in person and in virtual form, and have learned a few things in consequence. It all started in some sense with the lectures I did on Genesis in 2017. My family and I took a risk and rented out a theater in Toronto on the off chance that there might be an audience for what might be described as a psychological approach to our ancient stories. So and lo and behold. So if you notice, he said a, a psychological approach to the, those ancient stories. Um, remember, Dr. Peterson is a psychologist. And the approach he's taking to the Bible is a psychological one. So the issue with the Bible is that the Bible, number one, is a historical text. It was written in history, in time, by real people, in a real culture. And um, the Bible was written in a, an ancient language, Hebrew, and then Aramaic, and then Greek, and so forth. And the problem with taking a psychological approach to the Bible is that you need a certain standard. And, and, and Dr. Peterson is a disciple of Carl Jung. And Carl Jung was a student of Sigmund Freud. And we need to understand that Dr. Peterson approaches the Bible through the lenses of Carl Jung. And Carl Jung believed in things like dream interpretation. He believed in symbols and metaphors. Uh, and, and that is why Dr. Peterson makes these very broad, uh, sweeping statements about these truths in all religions. And so we, we need to understand that he's telling us up front, he's saying that my approach to the Bible is a psychological approach. Uh, and the problem with that is that the Bible is a, is a history book. It's a book that gives a story, a redemptive story. And that story occurred within real history. And there are certain principles that we use to interpret the Bible. This is called the field of hermeneutics and exegesis. Hermeneutics is the science of of interpreting the Bible based on language, based on culture, and so forth and so on. So I've taken courses. In my undergraduate years, uh, there was a, a, a writer by the name of Joseph Campbell, is a very well-known religious scholar. And what he would do is he would approach religion as if all religions teach the same truth, that there's this ultimate truth that all religions tap into. And I'm not saying Dr. Peterson is exactly like that, but there are many things he says that are very much like that that view that 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 all religions are essentially trying to say the same thing. Um, so I just wanted to make that very clear that Dr. Peterson is telling us this is my approach. It's a psychological approach. Yeah, and as a Christian, we see Bible as the very breath of God. So correct, written by humans, yet it is the breath of God. So inspired, inspired God inspired man to write it down. And Genesis, especially first three chapters of Bible, is the foundation of our faith. Correct. Who God is, uh, who man is, what is the problem, and what is the solution. So exactly. that everything we have, have, our foundation is like first three chapters of the Bible. Okay. And the way we handle the word of God is very different than how the secular world would handle it. Yes. Um, Yes, yeah. and I just wanted to add to that, Hatun. Those are good points you raised. Uh, I just wanted to add to that, um, that the Bible explains to us who we are, um, where we came from, why we're here, where we're going. The Bible gives us a full-orbed explanation of the value of human life, the sanctity of human life. The Bible tells us that uh, there was a beginning to all things, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created that time, space, matter, energy had a beginning, and that the God who made the universe is the one who defines us, that he's the one who defines us in terms of gender, uh, in terms of our sexuality and so forth, uh, our, our identity. Uh, and, and let me just say off, off the bat that we need to be careful with Dr. Peterson because Dr. Peterson supports homosexual marriage. Uh, he not only endorses homosexual marriage, but he believes that children can be raised in homosexual relationships, in homosexual families, and so forth. This was just put out about two weeks ago by LifeSite News, uh, where Dr. Peterson actually said that in, in an interview with David Rubin. So we need to be careful here. This, th this, this is not a member of the body of Christ. The body of Christ belongs to Christ. He owns the church. He gave his life for her. She is his bride. And to have another man come and tell his bride how she should live her life. It's like me coming up to a married 
woman and telling her, this is how you should live your life in your married relationship with your husband and take my advice. That is, that is unacceptable. So Jesus Christ is, is the husband of the church. He's, he's, he's jealous over his church. Just like God said that he's a jealous God, he's protective of his people and that he will not share his bride with another. And so this is why we need to be very careful that uh, there are speakers like Peterson that are very brilliant, very smart people, but they don't have the Holy Spirit, and therefore they are not organically connected to the church. And we ought to hear the voice of our master. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. They hear my voice. They recognize my voice and the voice of a stranger they will not follow. And so this is why we need to come back again to who rules the church, uh, who has jurisdiction over the church. No one has jurisdiction over the church except the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Uh, I, 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 can't just, I can't just walk into London, England and claim that I have authority to do whatever I want. I have no jurisdiction in London, England. But Jesus Christ not only has jurisdiction over his church, obviously he has jurisdiction over the whole cosmos. And so this is where, again, we need to be careful with, with Dr. Peterson. Yeah. Um, it's such a shame. He's like a pretty clever guy. Yes. And um, did uh, lectures on Genesis, yet failed to see God's intention in relationships. Right. Um, such a shame. Such a shame. Um, shall I continue with the video? Sure. sure. Behold, and miracle of miracles, there was. I completed 15 or so lectures walking through the first biblical book, sold out the theater, and attracted, surprisingly, millions of viewers, Christians, Jews, Muslims, and atheists. And most of the people who attended live, and the majority of those who watched online, were young men. That is not a phenomenon that can be easily accounted for. But let me try. Yeah, if you can now, talk, in the West... Yeah. I was just going to say that I, I did see some of those lectures that that he that he did on the book of Genesis, yeah. but unfortunately there was there's they walked away with these inspiring stories and metaphors and you know slaying slaying the dragon and 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 being a real man and so forth, but there was no gospel preached. There was no message of of repentance. Um, uh, Jesus said that the law, the prophets, and the Psalms they all they all talk about me. They're all about me. Yeah. Uh, and yet there was nothing. Uh, and, 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 you know, what Dr. Peterson did was he simply gave a, a wonderful lecture on, on these types and symbols and so forth and so on. But here's the problem, Hatun. I think the major problem with Dr. Peterson is there is no ultimate reference point. He has no ultimate standard or foundation to base these claims on. So my question to Dr. Peterson would be, by what standard are you making these statements? What is your standard? My standard is is the whole, is the triune God of Scripture. My standard is God is the ground and 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 foundation of all morality and ethics and meaning and purpose in the universe. What is your standard? And so I'm ground. We, you and I, Hatun, we're grounded on something. We're grounded on God. We're grounded on Him as the basis of all meaning and purpose and so forth. Um, and when Dr. Peterson talks about these things. You've got all these ideas, these these beautiful stories just floating in the air, but what are they resting on? What are they based on? Uh, and, and that's why at the end of the day, um, there is no ultimate foundation to what Dr. Peterson is saying. He he does he does sometimes approach that idea of God being the foundation, but you won't you won't hear him refer to this absolute foundation. You won't. Uh, and as I said, you won't even hear the word Jesus Christ in this video. Yeah, and one of the things as a Christian uh, we need to be careful is when we go to lectures or even the teachings, the when we leave that teaching, if we did we hear about revelation, did we hear about redemption, did we hear about regeneration? Those are the three things. When we come out from the lecture or from the sermons, we need to think about. If we haven't heard those things, that means that lecture or the teaching of the sermon had nothing to do with the Bible. Right, right. And, you know, the Greek philosophers... and regeneration, yeah. Exactly. The Greek philosophers uh, spoke a lot about, you know, Plato talked about the good. 
Um, and Aristotle spoke about ethics and so forth. But at the end of the day, these are just nice ideals. These are nice stories. Uh, but Plato had no problem about killing children who were disabled or blind or deaf and throwing them over the cliffs as the Greeks did. The Romans had no problem throwing their children into the woods and letting wolves and animals uh, uh, consume them because they were unwanted. Um, but these were really, you know, these were great thinkers and philosophers. But but morally speaking, some of them were involved in sodomy. Some of them were involved in, in infanticide and so forth and so on. Why? Because they have no basis. There is no foundation for their ethics. And, and Jesus was not a philosopher. Jesus didn't go around like, you know, you know, like Aristotle walking in circles and giving nice sermons. And the apostles did not do that. In fact, the apostle Paul um, debated with the philosophers in Acts 17, with the Athenians, with the Stoics and the Epicureans. He debated with them and he showed them that their worldview was inadequate to account for meaning in life and purpose in life. And that's why he gave them the gospel and said, this is realistic. This is a livable worldview because it's consistent with reality. Yeah. Let's continue. Mm -hmm. That is not a phenomenon that can be easily accounted for, but let me try. Now in the West, because of the weight of historical guilt that is upon us, a variant of the sense of original sin in a very real sense, and because of a very real attempt by those possessed by what might be described as unhelpful ideas to weaponize that guilt, our young people face a demoralization that is perhaps unparalleled. This is particularly true of young men, although anything that devastates young men will eventually do the same to young women. Yeah, let's pause and that, the in this era of anti- so what Dr. Peterson is going to talk about now is the, the, the effects of cultural Marxism that began the early uh, 20th century. And he's going to talk about the, 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 the critical race theory, the whole ideas of progressivism and, and so on. But you notice how he referred to it as original sin. So in critical race theory, uh, the original sin is that white people are guilty of the slave trade. Uh, white people are guilty of... of uh, discrimination and so forth and so on. Let's not talk about the Muslim slave trade in Eastern in Eastern Africa. Let's not talk about Islam and slavery. Uh, let's not talk about the fact that slavery still occurs today in Islamic countries. Uh, let's just keep focused on the West and Western uh, society. And so the original sin in this case is that because you're born as a white person with white skin, uh, you are forever guilty of, of being responsible for things like the slave trade and the crusades and, and so forth and so on. But what Dr. Peterson does not say is he doesn't talk about original sin in the biblical context, which is rebellion against God, that we are rebels against God, that we are in Adam and that in Adam all die. Uh, and he doesn't touch that. He, he uses that phrase, that theological term, original sin, but he doesn't give us the historic biblical context and meaning of that term. He's simply going to use that as an example of this cultural Marxist uh, uh, guilt trip that uh, they play on on uh, those who are so-called privileged and and the oppressors. Yeah, such a shame. Mm -hmm. Although anything that devastates young men will eventually do the same to young women. And that, in this era of antinatalism and equally reprehensible nihilism, is precisely the point. When they are children, boys are hectored for their toy preferences, which often include toy weapons such as guns, and their more boisterous playing style, as boys require active rough and tumble play, even more than girls, for whom it is also a necessity. When in grade school, boys are admonished, shamed, and controlled in a very similar manner by those who think that play is unnecessary, particularly if it's competitive, and who value a docile, harmless obedience above all. Shades of Dolores Umbridge. Following all that, because that's not enough, even when pursued assiduously for total demoralization, is the inculcation of an extremely damaging ideology, which essentially consists of three 
accusations. Number one, human culture, particularly in the West, is best construed as an oppressive patriarchy, motivated okay. by the desire, okay. willingness, and... So there you have it. There, there's the first point he makes, is that that oppressive patriarchy uh, that, he, that he mentions. And he was just talking about little boys and little girls in school and so forth. And how his whole point is that boys are being uh, are being demasculated or emasculated, that they're 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 being made more and more effeminate. But but this comes back to my question earlier, and that is by what standard? Okay, Dr. Peterson, you're making these statements, and I agree with him. But by what standard? What's the standard that you're using? My standard is again the Triune God. It's Holy Scripture that tells us that God made us male and female. But I have a basis for for my worldview. Uh, why is it wrong for little boys to be de-emasculated? De why is it wrong for little boys to be uh, feminized uh, or or made made to feel that maybe they're they're really girls? They're 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 they really should identify as women. Um, he doesn't explain that. He doesn't give us why that's wrong. He just says it's wrong, but he doesn't say why. I can say why it's wrong because God made a distinction between male and female. He made us male and female in his image. He created them. Uh, and so, again, I, I, the, the question that I keep hearing in my head is, Dr. Peterson, I agree with you, but by what standard are you saying this? What is your basis for what you're saying? Yeah, and also, we've been listening three, over three minutes, three minutes, 11 seconds, mm -hmm. and there is no name of Jesus mentioned so far. No, no, no. Not Yahweh is been mentioned so far. Such a yeah. shame. Message yeah, and, and I just yet. wanted to say that uh, someone in the chat was mentioning that I should offer discussion. I've reached out to Dr. Peterson repeatedly. I, I've invited him on my YouTube channel to discuss and talk. Um, but um, he is a very busy man, and as you know, he's tra he travels around the world. He he had a, a he had a, a health uh, problem a couple of years ago where. He was just he just disappeared and his, he, his life was was in, in peril uh, because of, of reactions he was having to a certain drug. Um, but I have reached out to him several times um, and hopefully, God willing, if he watches this program, God willing, that might precipitate a meeting between him and I. So, uh, as I said, I, I, I have met Dr. Peterson uh, in person. Uh, he's from Toronto, from the University of Toronto, where I am as well. And uh, he's a fine gentleman. He's a, he's a kind man. But what you're seeing, Hatun, is this is Romans 1 and Romans 2. All human beings have an awareness. Number one, they have an awareness of God, that he made the universe, that his fingerprints are all over the created order. Number two, God has placed his moral law into the conscience of every human being. And so Dr. Peterson knows about God's moral law. He knows that, that there is a God who made the universe. He may say yes, no, maybe he goes back and forth. Um, but, um, what you're hearing is Romans one, it's called general revelation. That is to say, all human beings have general revelation. God has made himself known through the created order, puts his moral law into our conscience, but there's a difference between general revelation and special revelation. Special revelation is what God has given in scripture. And the greatest event of God's special revelation is the incarnation. Where God came to us in the person of Jesus Christ. You can't learn that from general revelation. That is something that God reveals to us through his word and, of course, through the coming of Jesus Christ. Um, so Dr. Peterson has what everyone else has. We call it common grace. We call it general revelation. Yeah, and also um, on the t um, question of like reaching him and having um, conversation with him, when people have bigger platforms, they are busy. It is difficult to get hold on um, someone to have conversation. So therefore, we are just putting this video up. And I'm not sure if he even reached the Christians or um, Christian leaders or our scholars to say, okay, I'm going to give a message to the church. What would you like me to share with them? <laughs> I'm yeah. not sure. It doesn't look like from this video so far he no. has done anything about it. But yeah, when individuals have big, up, big platforms, um, they are busy with life, therefore it becomes much easier for us to just right. make a um, video respond and then right. um, get that out. So let's continue with the video. Culture, particularly in the West, 
is best construed as an oppressive patriarchy motivated by the desire, willingness, and ability to use power, defined as the compulsion of others against their will, to attain what are purely selfish and self-serving ends. This is true at every level of analysis. Marriage is akin to slavery, friendship to exploitation, political disagreement to war, and business arrangements to deception and theft. And this is true not only of the current social arrangements that characterize our culture, particularly in the West, but also the fundamental reality of history itself. Accusation number two. Human activity, particularly that undertaken in the West, is fundamentally a planet-despoiling enterprise. The human race is a threat to the ecological utopia that existed before us and that could hypothetically exist in our absence. We might well be construed even as a cancer. I was just going to say that he's going to talk a little bit about the progressive West, you know, climate change, and it's all about the environment and Mother Earth. We got to protect Mother Earth and so forth and so on. And I agree with what Dr. Peterson is saying, that, that they're basically placing human life below that of the ecology and the environment and so forth. But once again, why is human life so valuable? Why, why is human life so precious? Uh, what's the difference between a human being and, and, and a cow or a pig or a chicken or, or, or a hippopotamus? What's the difference? I mean, if we are all living organisms and if we are all evolved, according to Darwin, uh, from, from the same stuff, we're all evolved from the same stuff that everything else comes from, then why should humans have a special privilege of, of being better than all other living creatures? And, and there, there's, a, there's a statement that we use, Hatun, in, in the field of philosophy. There's a word called speciesism. And speciesism is the view that says that uh, human beings are, are better or human beings uh, should deserve uh, more rights than, than lower species and so forth and so on. This is usually used by ethicists like Peter Singer and others who, who believe that that human beings have no more value. He says a human baby has no more value than a chimpanzee, a dolphin, or 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 a, a, a any or a pig. Um, but you see, in the biblical worldview, humans are not just organisms. They're not just living creatures. They're God's image. They're the imago dei. God made humans in His image. He didn't make animals in His image or plants in His image and so forth and so on. He makes human beings in His image. And that is why God gives them dominion to rule, to have dominion over the, the fish and the land animals and over the birds of the air. In other words, when God created humans, he created us to be his vice regents on the earth, to rule the earth in his place. Um, and so that's why you have words like have dominion. That, that is regal royal language. That's the language of monarchy, to rule, to have dominion. And so... God then puts human beings at the pinnacle of his creation. That's why he creates them last. But according to Dr. Peterson's view, why should humans be afforded any more value than a barnyard of pigs or, or a herd of cattle? Without, without the Bible, you don't have an adequate response to that other than to say, well, we're just going to make up rules and believe that we were higher consciousness and therefore more important. So once again, what is your standard? By what standard? Um, if that's okay, can I read Genesis 1, Please. 26 to end? So that's people kind of follow up what we are talking about. Please. Genesis 1, uh, verse from 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over the earth, and over all creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over living creatures that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every 
tree that has fruit, uh, fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food, and all, all the breasts of the earth, beasts of the earth, and all the birds of the air, and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for, good, for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Uniqueness right. of man. Man is created in the image of king of kings. Man is right. created in image of God. Nothing right. else. Right. Man and woman is created in the image of Almighty. Right. And, and first man becomes the king of the world. Right. And, and, and you know, Hatun, you see the language of dominion and, and subdue. That's royal language. But remember that the first Adam was a type of the one to come. Because notice Jesus is also called, in Colossians 1.15, he's called the image of the invisible God. Jesus is the perfect image of the invisible God. And just as Adam was given kingship over the earth, Jesus is also the king. Not just king, but king of kings. And he is given the rulership over everything. He will rule from sea to sea. And just as Adam was created and made the son of God, Luke 3.38 says Adam was the son of God, because he was directly created by God, that is a pointer to the one who is truly the Son of God, the actual Son of God by nature. So Jesus is the last Adam. So notice the language, last Adam. So he's a fulfillment of that first man. Just as that first man was a king who ruled, Jesus is king. Just as the first man was the image of God, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Just as that man was Son of God by creation, Jesus is Son of God by nature. And Adam was a priest. How do we know Adam and Eve were priests? They offered up sacrifice. They, they saw the sacrifice where God killed the animals to clothe them. And where did Abel learn the principle of sacrificing sheep? Abel learned it from his parents. And so uh, Adam and Eve were priests. They approached God in the garden. And, and they were also prophets. Well, why were they prophets? Because they spoke God's word. And they spoke God's word to their children. And so the figure of Adam is a powerful image because Adam is that image is replicated in the nation of Israel. Israel becomes a corporate son of God, Exodus 4.22. And then the king is the son of God, Psalm 2.7. The king, uh, David, is, is king. He's also the son of God by, by decree. Thou art my son forever. Uh, after, and he's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And so this imagery, it's not just a real man. There was a real Adam, but there was also a powerful spiritual dimension connected to that first man. And how does the book Revelation end, Hatun? It ends with a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem, where Christ reigns forever. In other words, it is a return back to Eden, but it's a perfection. It's a completion. And so that's why the book Revelation ends where Genesis begins. It, it ends with a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem, and a river that will flow out of the throne of God. Not four rivers out of Eden, but this time a river of life that will flow out of the throne of God. Yeah. And we are almost over four minutes um, of the video. And so far, we didn't hear anything about Jesus yet. Yeah. Still waiting. Not yet. Uh, let's continue. Sure. And that could hypothetically exist in our absence. We might well be construed even as a cancer that threatens the very viability of the complex systems that make up the ecosystem of the earth that shelters and supports us. We are facing a Malthusian catastrophe of overpopulation and biosphere degradation. And we have to place extreme limits on our wants, even our needs, so that survival itself even in a much reduced form, can be guaranteed. Accusation well, number three. If you just want to pause that. So again, we we agree with Dr. Peterson there. Uh, but did you notice what he said? Notice that the climate change alarmists and the environmentalists, and, and this includes this includes the G7 nations, including Canada and, and the UK and France and others, uh, where... These countries are talking about eliminating fossil fuels and coal and, and renewable, having renewable energy and so forth. But one of the things they always mention is that the earth is overpopulated. There's too many people on the earth. 
And so what does that mean? Well, you shouldn't have, stop having children. Uh, don't have, uh, have only one child. Don't have too many children. The earth is overpopulated as it is. So how do we do this? How do we bring down the population? Well, you endorse abortion. You have abortion on demand. You, you play down the family. You, you redefine what it means to be male and female, what it means to be father and mother. And remember what you just quoted there, Hatun, in Genesis 128. God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. What are the, what are the progressive environmentalists saying? No, don't be fruitful and depopulate. Don't populate. Don't fill the earth. Depopulate. Cut down the population of the world. So this is a, a satanic, it's a, it is an anti-God, anti-Christ system that hates the image of God. That's why they're pro-death. They love abortion. They love euthanasia. They love, uh, here in Canada, we have assisted suicide where doctors can assist the patient in, in terminating their life. So we're living in a world where human life has been denigrated. The, the life of animals are more important. We've got to save the whales. We need to save the seals, you know, save the dogs, save the kids. I have nothing against creatures. I love God's creatures. They're his creatures. But you are seeing a devaluation of human life. And what you're seeing is they are deifying the earth. It's a return back to paganism where the earth was worshipped, right? So Mother Earth, uh, Gaia, the Greeks called her Gaia. Um, and, and therefore, what we're finding here is Romans 1 in practice. What does Paul say in Romans 125? They worshipped the creation rather than the creator who is blessed forevermore. So that's what you're finding here, Hatun is the worship of man. This is the war. This is idolatry at its height. They reject the creator. They exchanged his truth for a lie. And they took what he created and they've made them into idols and worship them. So we're, we're in total agreement with Dr. Peterson here. But once again, I have a basis for what I'm saying. What does Dr. Peterson have? What is he basing that on? What's his standard? And that's what I'm still waiting for is what is your basis? What is your standard for all this? As a Christian, when we see throughout the scripture, out of God's kindness, out of his generosity, he gave us this planet. Yeah. And he put Adam and Eve and Adam, like the first man who is kind of king over the world. Yeah. Uh, so therefore, as a Christian, we know the need of looking after the creation God given to us. Correct. But that doesn't mean in any form or in any shape that we get rid of the babies or right. we get rid of the family or we get rid of the values which scripture sets forward. Right. Um, that's such a um, sad um, that we live in a timeline now where people are simply against life. Right. Uh, let's continue. Even in a much reduced form can be guaranteed. Accusation number three. The prime contributor both to the tyranny that makes up the oppressive patriarchy and structures all of our social interactions, past and present, and the unforgivable despoiling of our beloved Mother Earth is damnable male ambition, competitive and dominating, power-mad, selfish, exploitative, raping and pillaging. You might think that I'm overstating the case. Think again, sunshine. We in the West, are facing an all-out assault at the deepest levels on what that old joker Jacques Derrida deemed the fell logocentric conceptual structure of civilization itself. To take that apart, that's a society centered on the encouraging, adventurous, masculine spirit, and that privileges that hated word of all things, the divine logos. And what should we worship? and celebrate properly yeah. other than that deconstructionists that. yeah so so the first thing he's going to talk about is this this hatred for the masculine the patriarchy and so forth and it's interesting that if you really dig deep at this uh Hatun, what you're going to find is that the hatred of the patriarchy remember god is father right god is we we the first person of the trinity is is god the father and the father is considered the head of, of the Trinity, the fountainhead of, of the Trinity. And, you know, in Ephesians chapter three, Paul talks about how he bows his knees to the father from whom all things are named. 
And so this anger, this hatred towards that which is patriarchal, we're not talking about patriarchal abuses because there are abuses on both sides. There's abuses both by men and women. Um, you know, you just have to look at the Amber Heard and Johnny Depp trial to see that, that it's not just men who can become abusive. Women can be abusive as well, physically abusive. Um, but the idea here is this attack on the idea of, of, of masculinity. And remember, in Scripture, Adam was the first human being created. So it's not, it's not female and then male. It's, it's the male is created first and then the female. And the idea of, of attacking this masculine identity is something that, once again, goes back to the early 20th century with the culture Marxists. And the culture Marxists understood. They clearly understood this idea that the family, the nuclear family of a man, a woman, and a child, they understood that in the Bible, God has delegated to men or the husbands the authority to be heads over their families. That is to be the head of the wife, the head of the family, to be the protector of the family. But in order to destabilize that, they had to attack a masculinity. They had to attack the father figure. And this has been going on for at least 80 to 100 years now in the West. But once again, we know where that comes from. And Dr. Peterson is right. He knows where it's coming from. But ultimately, why is who is the one who they are attacking? Ultimately, the ultimate target here is God himself. And that is why many churches today that have gone liberal, and this includes the Church of England, and the Church of England now is saying they, they don't know what is what is an appropriate oh, definition of what is a woman. I mean, they need I mean Jesus. just they think just about that. Jesus. Yeah, I, I mean, I was just interviewing not too long ago, I was interviewing Father Calvin Robinson, um, who was rejected for ordination in the Church of England, and he's now with the Free Church of England because of his position on these matters. Um, and so now a lot of the churches that are going liberal, that are moving to the left, are adopting this, this thinking, and that is why many of these churches are dying. They're losing members. They're bleeding out. They're losing members. Um, and it's not just in the Church of England. We see this in, in the, the Lutheran Church, the um, uh, EL. CA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, is losing members, the Presbyterian churches, and, and Bapt even Baptist churches that have gone uh, liberal and so forth. Um, so this is a cancer that is not just affecting society, but churches that have adopted this worldview to look politically correct and to look attractive and to look like they're, they're up with the times. These churches are going to pay a very high, heavy price because they're compromising the truths of Holy Scripture. Yeah, and that kind of reminds us the letters to the churches um, in Book of Revelation, how God like kind of calls them to repentance and then says, you forgot your first love. Correct. You compromised, you forgot your first love. And uh, it is sad that even the world doesn't know that they are forgiven by the blood of Lord Jesus Christ in the body of Christ within the church. Right. We have brothers and um, sisters, even people we look up as our shepherds, they forgot to love Jesus. They need desperately Lord Jesus Christ. Um, all they need to do is like turn Genesis 1, 2, 3 and then find the definition what is woman. Such a such a shame, such a shame. Yeah. But we do call them to repentance for the actions they do, um, the way they handle the word of God, because they will be accountable for that at the end. Correct. Correct. And you know, when the Archbishop of Canterbury says that the Church of England is institutionally racist, I mean, this is not what the gospel is. The, the gospel says there is no Jew, no, no Gentile, no woman, no man, no slave, no freeman, but one in Christ. Um, and when you adopt, the, and this is a Marxist ideology, when you adopt a Marxist ideology, which is rooted in atheism, Karl Marx made it very clear that religion is the opium, it's the drug of the people. When you adopt Marxist thinking, which is rooted in atheism, you're going to have problems. And the Roman Catholic Church is having the same problem because Pope Francis believes, he, he, Pope Francis is a Marxist. 
in Argentina, he was he was attracted to liberation theology, which is an offshoot of Marxism. And that is why you see this watering down of the gospel. There's a watering down of biblical authority. Um, and it's not, again, I'm not pointing fingers. It's not just the Church of England. It's not just the Roman Catholic Church. The, the, the Southern Baptist Convention uh, is being rocked with these same problems as well, with sexual abuse cases and, of course, critical race theory and so forth. So we need to go back to what did the reformers say? And this is why there's a beautiful statement, uh, Hatun, that says that the church, Ecclesia uh, Semper Reformanda, meaning the church is always reforming. And we need to go back to what the reformers taught us. What did the reformers teach us? They said, at fontes means in Latin, it means back to the fountains, back to the sources. What does that mean? Let's get back to the scriptures. The scriptures do not change. Culture changes. Nations change. People come and go. But the word of our God endures forever. It never changes. And so the churches that are surviving today and are growing are churches that are faithful to the word of God, and they will not compromise the gospel with our secular society. So there's a battle going on right now. It's between Christ and Caesar. It's the battle. It's a, it's a tale of two kings, Christ and Caesar. And a lot of our churches, unfortunately, are bowing the knee to Caesar. They're letting Caesar take authority over the church, and they're committing high treason against her king. Only the king, Christ Jesus, has the final say in his church. It is his body. He purchased it with his precious blood. And so my, my warning to the church today is, folks, if you're allowing this Marxist ideology into your churches, he's going to come, like he said, he says, I will come and I will take away your lampstand. And the moment he removes the lampstand, all you you're done, you're finished. The church is over. There's darkness will come. And he's done that already. There's a lot of churches that the Lord has judged already and he shut them down. Uh, and they're going to end up as beautiful museums, just like in Europe. There's beautiful churches, and they're all museums. You can go through tourist uh, visits and so forth, but they're dead. They're empty shells. They have no life in them. Heartbreaking, though. Heartbreaking. It but um, it, it, should, it should encourage us to call our brothers and sisters to repentance and turn to Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And it is... I think it is amazing. Um, you did express like um, order, um, order in the creation and in gender. Before anything, like we identify God as his judge, his ruler, his king. But before anything, God is father. Before there was anything, before he was king, before he was ruler, he was father to his son eternally. Right. And we look at the account of creation you express, like Adam and Eve. Um, none of, like, this order doesn't make mo woman less valuable no. or not have any dignity or anything. It just gives us the structure Correct. who is the head of. Correct. And we are all, like, even though um, husband is the head of the woman, but above all, Christ is the head of the church. So, Correct. Um, Correct. That is not... A put that that is not negative in any form or any shape according to scripture according to scripture correct um shall we continue sure sure that's a society centered on the encouraging adventurous masculine spirit and that privileges that hated word of all things the divine logos and what should we worship and celebrate properly okay. Very, Other than very, that, deep. Let, let, let me make a comment there. Now, the closest he comes to saying anything uh, about name. Jesus is the divine logos. Now, what, I want you to hear that, the divine logos. Now, this is very, very important to understand Dr. Peterson. The divine logos, the word logos means word, it means reason, it means logic. It's the word that John uses in John 1, 1. In the beginning was the logos, the logos was with God, and the logos was God. Now, the Greek philosophers believed in the Logos. They spoke about the Logos. But the Logos was divine, to be sure. But the Logos was distinct from the world. And here's the catch. The Logos could never enter the world. The divine Logos in Greek philosophy could never enter the world. And that's why St. Augustine said, when he became a Christian, St. Augustine said that 
in all his years studying philosophy, he never read these words, and the Logos became flesh. In Christianity, the word becomes flesh and dwells amongst us. Even the Muslims agree with the Greek philosophers that the Logos could not enter into the creation uh, that he made. In other words, to the Muslims, oh, no, 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 God could never enter into his creation. It's beneath his majesty. He cannot do that. And so they agree with the pagan Greeks that God cannot enter his creation. Whereas in the Bible, God not only appears throughout the Old Testament as the angel of Yahweh, uh, he appears in the fire and so forth and so on. But in the New Testament, the second person of the Trinity, the Logos, the Word, becomes flesh. The divine enters into the human atmosphere or the, the human dimension. And now the Son of God is both divine and human forever. He didn't, he, he didn't stop being human after the resurrection. He is still the God-man, and he is forever the God-man for all eternity. And so what does divine logos mean for Dr. Peterson? Well, the divine logos is this, this truth that, that permeates all reality, and that this logos, this divine logos, doesn't just permeate all reality, but it's the truth found in everything. So he doesn't reduce it just to Christianity. He would say the divine logos is something that, it permeates other uh, other realities, and so other people can have access to the divine logos. But this is the closest he comes to saying anything about the Bible. So that was uh, just under the six minutes. So all we heard was divine logos with the wrong definition, though. Correct. Uh, let's continue. Constructionists, the words of that mass murderer Karl Marx, and it is precisely those young men who are deeply conscientious, capable of guilt and regret, who have come to believe in pain that every deep impulse that moves them out into the world for the adventure of their life, even that impulse drawing them to women, is nothing but the manifestation of a spirit that is essentially satanic in nature. This is not only wrong theologically, morally, psychologically, practically, and scientifically, it is literally anti-true. It's not a mere misstatement about the nature of reality. It's 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 theologically wrong. It's 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 morally it's wrong. True. But on what basis? It's not true. Okay, but what is truth? What is what is the basis of truth? So again, we're just been giving these ideas, but they're just floating in the air. They're they're not resting on anything. So. Yeah, Ru root is not there, which root no. is supposed to be a scripture. It, it's like me, it, you know, Hatun, it's like me taking off my coat and just hanging it in midair. Well, no, it's not going to hang in midair. It's going to fall to the ground. If I put, if I need to hook my, my, my coat on a stand, it has to be based on something. It has to stand on something. It, it, you know, I don't just put it up in the air because it's going to fall. It, 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 it's not resting on anything. So again, um, there's all these wonderful claims, but if you notice very carefully too, Hatun, he's using our language. That language is 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 biblical language, and yeah. so and so a lot of liberals and humanists they can't live consistently. And I'm borrowing a little Francis Schaeffer's language here, but but people who live in the lower level of the world and you know the the first story level of the world, they can't live consistently, so they have to jump to the second story to use our language, words like truth and morality and meaning and absolutes and so forth because they can't live without it in in somehow like they are desperate yeah absolutely for their, yet they can't like they choose to walk away they choose to become godless again like they there is a desperateness but also there is not willing to do something about it right um okay let's continue scientifically it is literally anti-true. It's not a mere misstatement about the nature of reality, a minor conceptual error, but something that literally could not be farther from the truth. And something that distant from the truth comes from a place that cannot be distinguished from hell. The Christian church is there to remind people, young men included, and perhaps even first and foremost, that they have a woman to find, a garden to walk in, a family to nurture, an ark to build, a land to conquer, a ladder to heaven to build, and the utter terrible catastrophe of life. Uh, 
a ladder so to have a ladder what? to heaven to build. Um, we we don't build our, our way to heaven. And Jacob in his dream, Jacob didn't build that ladder. He saw that ladder in his dream, and the Lord was standing at the top of the ladder, and the angels were coming up and down. In other words, that was the ladder that God connected. It was a picture of Jesus, the one who connects earth with God, man with God, right? Jesus uses that language when he says in John 1, he says, he says to his disciples, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. He's using the language of Jacob's uh, ladder, the dream that Jacob had. But notice he says to build a ladder to heaven. No. And, and, and the first thing the church teaches you is not go out and find a woman and have kids and build a house. What happened to the Great Commission? Did Jesus say, go therefore uh, and, and make husbands and wives of the nations and tell them to build arcs and build ladders? No, the Great Commission is go and make disciples of all the nations. So everything Dr. Peterson is saying is fine, but these are these are subsets. These are these are secondary issues. They're not primary to the gospel. In other words, unless the heart is changed, if the if the heart of man isn't changed, nothing's going to change on the outside. Change has to begin inside first before it changes on the outside. And so Dr. Peterson is talking about actions, doing this, doing that. But how can anyone who does not have the spirit of God in them Without the fruit of the Spirit, you can't do anything good or peaceful or, 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 or things that are lovely and acceptable and so forth. In other words, he's not dealing with the sin problem. The heart is desperately wicked. The problem isn't here. The problem isn't outside. It's inside us. And, and so these are nice sayings, you know, like, you know, human potentiality, you know, self-help program. That's wonderful. But this has nothing to do with the gospel. The primary focus of the gospel is repentance, getting right with God, accepting Christ as Lord and Savior. And then all these other things will follow, right? Seek first, Jesus said, Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added, like what? Food and clothing and so forth. Jesus taught us to seek God and his kingdom first, not these material things. It's... Um... By default, our hearts are curved in itself, okay? Yeah. And whatever we do, we will never able to build anything to get to God. Correct. Therefore, eternal son of the father stepped into this world as a baby, lived among us, and then left his heart for us with his death and his resurrection. Right. When our hearts start beating with him, Everything around us and in us changes. That's right. What we do is, as we yeah. press, we go and make disciples, not go and make babies, but go and make disciples. Yeah. And, and you know, Jesus Christ as the new Adam, as the new man, the last Adam, uh, Christ, Jesus Christ has created a new humanity. That's why in the Bible, you're either in Adam or you're in Christ. You can't be in both. You're, if you're in Adam, you will die. If you're in Christ, you will be made alive. And therefore, there are two humanities. There is fallen humanity in Adam, and there is a new redeemed humanity that Christ has created through his death and resurrection. And that is why, unless you're in Christ, um, I mean, you can be a philanthropist, you could be a humanitarian, you can be a nice husband to your wife, nice father to your kids. But if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, what did Jesus say? What does it profit a man? if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? Um, and again, the, 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 it's like Dr. Peterson is almost treating this like someone has malignant cancer and you're giving them an aspirin. Well, an aspirin is not going to help your cancer. You, you need treatment. You need, uh, you need aggressive treatment, whether it's chemo or radiation, whatever it may be. You don't treat cancer with an aspirin. And so the gospel doesn't just give you treatment. It, it eradicates the cancer of sin. God forgives us our sins. We are justified by faith alone in Christ. We are, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things are past. Everything becomes new. So the gospel message is the only thing that will change the hearts of men and women. And that's what Dr. Peterson is not mentioning. But why would he? He's not in the church. He's not in the body of Christ. Yeah, so our hearts is the problem. Yeah. 
And Jesus gives us a solution by his death and his resurrection. He gives us new heart. Correct. Um, okay, let's continue. That they have a woman to find, a garden to walk in, a family to nurture, an ark to build, a land to conquer, a ladder to heaven to build, and the utter terrible catastrophe of life to face stalwartly in truth, devoted to love and without fear. Invite the young men back. Say literally to those young men, you are welcome here. If no one else wants what you have to offer, we do. Okay, we want to call you to the highest purpose of your life. I don't know any churches that 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 have a sign saying no young men welcome. <laughs> uh, it's my understanding that the church says you know our signs all have all all are welcome. Uh, yeah. So I, I'm not. I, I know what he's getting at. That he's going to say the churches have failed young men, and I think and I believe to a certain extent that it's, that's true. A society has failed us, and the churches that have abandoned God's word have failed us as well. But I, I just don't understand what he means by churches should have signs saying young men are welcome here. I, I have yet to find a church. Uh, I've never seen a sign saying uh, all are welcome except young men. So I, that's why I'm not. I'm a little confused as to what Dr. Peterson is saying there. We are all sinners and we are all welcome exactly. to church. Exactly. Where we need to challenged, encouraged, and kept accountable by our brothers and sisters. Correct. Um, doesn't matter you are young, you are old, you are man, you are woman, you are black, you are white, you are all welcome because there is a problem in your heart and you all need Lord Jesus Christ. Exactly. Um, let's continue the young men back say literally to those young men you are welcome here if no one else wants what you have to offer we do we want to call you to the highest purpose of your life we want your time and energy and effort and your will and your goodwill we want to work with you to make things better to produce life more abundant for you and for your wife and children, and for your community, and your country. Okay, before so, you say anything, brother, let me just ask you a basic question. Sure, sure. What is the highest purpose of our life? Is that, it to make things better, or give you more and more and more? What is the purpose of yeah, our that, life? That's exactly, that's exactly what I was going to get at, and, and that is the highest purpose in life is to know the Lord. Uh, you know, yeah. you know, the Westminster Confession of Faith says, what is the whole duty of man but to love God and enjoy him forever? Um, and that and that's just not what I'm hearing here. What I'm hearing here is we'll we'll, we'll give you a self-help program. And, and how how is that the highest point of uh, uh, meaning of your life? And then but notice he uses language like to give life abundantly. He's quoting John 10:10 10, 10, where Jesus says in 10:9 he says that um, the thief comes to kill, to steal and destroy. Uh, but I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. So he's quoting John 10, verse 10, where Jesus is talking about, I am the door. Whoever walks through me will have life everlasting. And then he says that um, that he will give them life and that he will provide for them and that he is their good shepherd. Isn't that amazing? So he'll quote words from Jesus's mouth where Jesus is pointing to himself and calling us to himself. And yet, in, in this context, he's talking about how the church can give you life abundantly by telling you how, you know, how it's, it's like it's like that movie with Jack Nicholson. There's that forgot the name of the movie now, but where where he meets this young woman and, and he says, uh, she makes me want to be a better man. And so it's all about becoming a better man, a better person. But there is no one who is good. There is no one who has. You know, the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is no goodness in us until God has redeemed us and, and saved us. Um, so it's just sad because Dr. Peterson has such a powerful influence over people. You, you know, this would have been an opportune time for him to, to mention the gospel. But then again, um, he's not a believer. And so why would we expect that? It's... Um... It is not about having better life. 
scripture tells us that we will have life in its fullness because of Jesus. And in the phrase of like, have uh, live more, more life, better life. It's when it's better is enough better. We always want more and more and more because there is something in our hearts always like desire more and more and more and more. Scripture doesn't tell us like, okay, you are going to get more and more. Scripture tells us we will be satisfied with Lord Jesus Christ. Right. It's sufficient enough for our desires. And also, um, the uh, like, Scripture tells us, on the other hand, life is not going to get better. You will be persecuted because of me. The world is going to hate you. So in, in, in one sense, he's like saying the things actually Bible doesn't teach. And if the church is there to tell people, I'm going to come here, you will have better life. Um, uh, everything will be more abundant for you. That's not the gospel. That's not the right. biblical teachings. Right. Right. It, it, and and wrong, Jesus, wrong. yeah, I mean, you know that, Hatun. You know that firsthand and personally. You know the cost of following Christ. And, you know, the Lord Jesus himself said that, that what is it like to follow me? Deny everything, deny yourself, and take up your cross every day and follow me. Wow. Uh, so you mean I have to suffer? Yep. Following me, taking up the cross. The people who carry the cross are going to their deaths. So, so people who carry their crosses are condemned to die. Christ calls us to die to ourselves. And that means it's not about us. It's about him. It's all him. He's the only thing that matters in our lives. Um, because we owe everything we have to him. Uh, and, and so, again, I, it, Dr. Peterson is, I mean, he's giving you some good advice, like a, a counselor would give you good advice, but that is not the role of the church. That is a subset of the role of the church. But we got to deal with that, that, that spiritual cancer first. We got to get that spiritual cancer out of you before you can get well and before you can start functioning again and enjoying life that cancer has to be dealt with. And that cancer is sin. And Dr. Peterson is not addressing the core problem. Yeah. Highest purpose of our life is enjoy Christ. Indeed. The light in him. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's continue. To produce life more abundant for you and for your wife and children and for your community and your country and the world. And we have our problems in the Christian church. We are more abundant and sometimes far too often corrupt and sometimes deeply so. We are outdated as are all institutions with their roots in the dead but still often wise past. So join us. We'll help fix you up and you can help fix us up. And together we'll aim up. And here is a message to those young men skeptical that. about such things. Do you remember in the Bible, uh, the, the first people to say, let us build something that will take us up, yeah. something that will take us up to the heavens, whose height will reach to the heavens. That's the language of the rebels in the Tower of Babel, where they were one language, one people, and they said, let's make a name for ourselves. And let's make a city, a tower, whose heights will reach heaven. And what does God do? God comes down and God confounds the languages. So they want to make a name for themselves. And God says, you're not going to make a name for yourselves. And then in chapter 12, God calls a man from Mesopotamia by the name of Abram. And God says, I will make your name great. And I will make a nation out of you. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So God is the one who makes Abraham's name great. And it's God who establishes a nation out of him. But notice the order. In the Tower of Babel, we're going to make our names great. We're going to build our city. We're going to be uh, about, it's about us and about our fame. And God comes down in judgment. And yet in Genesis 12, right after Genesis 11, in Genesis 12, God takes it upon himself to make Abraham's name great, to bring a nation out of him. Notice what God does. He creates a nation state. What is the G7 all about? Globalism. It's all about everything, you know, the global world, the global village, get rid of nation states. Uh, and, that, and that's not doing too good, is it? I mean, Boris Johnson has stepped down. 
uh, you, you're the Italian prime minister, uh, the Estonian prime, uh, prime minister, and, and Canada. We're hoping the prime minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, will step down too. Uh, pray for us. Um, but that's exactly what we find is, is that this globalist vision is, is a recipe for disaster. And that's exactly, if you look at our world today, that's exactly what's happening. We're going to create a, a world economic forum. We're going to have a global village. We'll tell you what to eat. You can have crickets instead of beef and uh, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. That's where we are today. And it's a result of rebellion against the king, just like in the days of Babel. So I, I define our days today. We are living in the same time period that the people of Babel were living in. We think that we can make a name for ourselves and it ends up in confusion. That's what babbling is about, right, Hatun? When we call someone a babbler, it's someone that is incoherent. We can't understand what they're saying. That is why there's confusion today on sexual identity. There's confusion on what, what is a woman. There's confusion on language. These are all results of rebellion against God who defines us in all those areas. I find um, it's it's strange that while he give lectures on Genesis, he's still teaching like we need to aim up. Come, we will fix you, and then you will fix us. We will help each other to fix one another. Even in Genesis, you get to see no, we cannot fix ourselves. My family is not able to fix me. My mm -hmm. leaders are not able to fix me. Therefore, I need someone who can come from up to down to exactly. fix me. Not go from down to up, but comes exactly. from up to down to fix exactly. us. So you ever and notice when, you ever notice when you're when you're not not well, when you're sick? All right? When you're lying down, there's only one way to look. And it's to okay. look up. And sometimes God has to put us on our backs. Sometimes God will put us on our backs because that's the only time he's going to get us to look up. And, and so you're absolutely right. The, the, see, the world, the world tells you that the problem um, is out there. The problem is the patriarchy. It's the church. It's the government. The problem is your family, your Christian family. And it's always someone else. Always it's someone else. I am, I am never a problem. My heart is exactly. never Exactly. So, you know, Adam and Eve, remember Adam said, well, the woman you gave me, she made me sin. So not really my fault. And then the woman said, no, it's the serpent. You know, mm -hmm. when you're pointing the finger at someone here, when you're pointing the finger, you got to realize you got three fingers pointing back at you. Right. And, and, and so in, in, the, in the case, of, in the case of, of, of the blame game where we, we keep blaming everyone, you know, so it's the government, it's the family, it's the church, and and the answer's in here. No, the Bible says it's the exact opposite. The Bible says, no, the problem is in there. The heart is desperately wicked above all things, Jeremiah 79. And where's the answer? Just like you said, Hatun, the answer is up there. And therefore, we whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We need to call on him. The answer's out there. It's not in us. We are the problem, right? J.K. Chesterton once um, wrote a letter to the a newspaper. The newspaper said, what's wrong with the world? And G.K. Chesterton wrote and said, dear editors, I am what's wrong with the world. Yeah. It's us. We find, we find, I, I find very difficult to say, I am sorry, that's my problem. I was even telling that to someone yesterday. <laughs> like, uh, if, if you hear I said, I am sorry, I probably mean it because I never say I'm sorry. I am never a problem. It's right. always right. someone else. Yeah, and then yeah. also another thing came to my mind as you were talking about like how leaders. Uh, so we've got King Saul. Uh, he has great start. Oh yeah, he starts like this great, great king. Everyone has great expectations. He's gonna get yeah. through everything, and then what you see at the end, his fall. How yeah. he falls. People will be placed in certain places, but yeah. that will take them down because yeah. we've got king of kings above all. Right. So God will take um, those people down. Um, yes, we will have great start with individuals, but at the end, we've got one ruler who rules all. 
That's right. And Saul was the people's choice, right? He was yeah. handsome. He was like Fabio, you know, yeah. he was handsome. He had everything. He was tall. And certainly a king must look tall and handsome and and and, old, and ruddy and strong and muscular. He was the people's choice. That He was not God's choice. The people were clamoring for a king. But what was God's choice? God's choice was a skinny, little, scrawny young boy, a shepherd boy yeah. by the name of David. Whom and God, no one even gave attention to him. Yeah. They, they, I mean, Samuel went to anoint the new king, and Jesse said, well, here's my kids. And he says, the Lord says they're none, none of them are the candidates for the monarchy. And he said, do you have any other sons? He goes, oh, there's this. We have a young one. He's out in the fields, and you know, he takes care of the sheep. Bring him here. That's the man. The one we least expect, right? God, God chooses the weak things of the world to show his power. The things the world deems foolish, God uses to show his wisdom. And yeah. so, so God, the man after God's own heart was a, was an insignificant little skinny shepherd boy, and who would be the who would be the ancestor of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of David. So um, again, uh, the answer is out there, and 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 Dr. Peterson unfortunately is is acting like no, the answer is in you. You can do it. It's human potentiality. Yeah. So I'm taking those screenshots um, because I'm using this new app and it's giving me this funny signal. Just took the screenshots. Oh. I know what to check after afterwards. Um, let's continue. So we are um, just over eight minutes of the video now. And you can help fix us up. And together we'll aim up. And here is a message to those young men skeptical about such things. What else do you have? You can abandon the churches in your cynicism and disbelief. You can say to yourself narcissistically and solipsistically, the church does not express what I believe properly. Who cares what you believe? Why is this about you? Do you even want it to be about you? What if it was about others? What if it was about your duty to the past? and to the broader community that surrounds you in the present? What if it was incumbent upon you and vital to your health and willingness even to live to rescue your dead father from the belly of the beast where he has always resided and to restore him to life? Once again, to the churches, Protestant, you're the worst at the moment. You really want to Catholic, stop. Orthodox. So you can see he's not a big fan of Protestants, uh, and that's because we are we 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 keep pointing back to the scripture, scripture alone, scriptura, sola scriptura, sola scriptura, scripture alone. Um, and he says, "You all probably, about Jesus. It's yeah, all about the, the, Jesus." The Protestants are the worst. Now, don't get me wrong; all denominations have problems, right? The Roman Catholic Church was rocked with sex scandals and pedophilia in in the in the in the priesthood and. And of course, uh, the Southern Baptist Convention had sexual abuse problems, and and the Orthodox have it as well. We don't hear as much because they're in the East, the Eastern Church. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, it's 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 all of us are broken, uh, and no one's saying that the church is perfect. And I've always said, Hatun, if you ever find a perfect church, don't join it, because it yeah. won't be perfect for long. So so uh, again, anyway, I think he probably takes that jab at Protestant. Protestant Christians, probably because we are very uh, bibliocentric. It's it's sola scriptura. Um, yeah, there are there are there are issues um, within the church as an institution. There are issues um, in us as human who are belong to the body of Christ. But at the end, we all need Jesus, and He is sufficient enough savior. Exactly. He can fix us. He can fix us. And uh, therefore, it is important that when we see uh, one of us looks more worse than other, or one of us looks more corrupted than other, we call upon them for repentance. So they turn, get on their knees, turn to Lord Jesus Christ, who is there to forgive us. Right. Um so um, in that sense, um, yes, he's got a message to um, people, to us, um, that we need to make it all about Jesus. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe I'll just edit that part and then send it to the head of the Church of England that it might help <laughs> him. 
it might help him with some things. Uh, but let's let's continue. They might they might ordain Jordan Peterson as a priest there too. You never know. <laughs> you know, you never know. If you if you focus on Bible, you don't get anything here. But yeah, let's let's say the belly of the beast, where he has always resided, and to restore him to life. Once again, to the churches, Protestant, you're the worst at the moment. Catholic, Orthodox, invite young men, put up a billboard, say, young men are welcome here. Print some flyers and put them in a box by the billboard. Signal the existence of those flyers with an arrow, with the words, more information about attending here. Tell those who have never been in a church exactly what to do, how to dress, when to show up, who to contact, and most importantly, what they can do. Ask more, not less, of those you are inviting. Ask more of them than anyone ever has. Remind them who they are in the deepest sense and help them become that. Your churches, for God's sake, quit fighting for social justice. Quit saving the bloody planet. Attend to some souls. That's what you're supposed to do. So if you can just that's your that. holy duty. Yeah. So again, uh, I don't know about you, but my church, we're not concerned about. Uh, we believe in biblical social justice, but we're not concerned about the Marxist social justice movement. Uh, um, we speak against it. Um, I, I lost a job position at a seminary here in Canada because I spoke out against things like this. And I spoke out against um, our uh, our prime minister here. And I, I, I came right out and said he hates Christians. And because of that, they dismissed me. And even though it's, it's, it's proven record, it's on the record, it's public record. Um, so my home church, um, we, we don't support any of these ideas. We we're not into the social justice movement. We're not into this whole climate change thing and so forth and so on. If anything, what Dr. Peterson is addressing here is he's addressing these liberal churches, these apostate liberal churches. Um, but they can't help because they're in the same boat as he is because they've abandoned, they've abandoned the very source that can change us. They've abandoned the author of life who could give us meaning and purpose. And so at the end of the day, Dr. Peterson is pretty much offering the same hope that these other liberal churches are offering. Um, what are your thoughts on um, asking more, making people to do more and more and more? Well, there's nothing they can do to save themselves. Salvation, yeah. salvation has been paid for. Jesus paid it all, all to him we owe. And so it's not a matter of being more and more, but Jesus Christ changes us and we become like him. You see, you see, Hatun, the whole point is this. In the Christian life, there's something called the imitatio Christi, means the imitation of Christ. We are called to imitate the Lord Jesus. You know, Paul says, be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. It also says, be imitators of God. So if we're made in the image of God, we are called to imitate him. And, and when we imitate God, what do we do? We, we, we become responsible people. We, we are concerned for truth. We are concerned for the livelihood of others. We are concerned for the welfare of others and so forth. But once again, Dr. Peterson is not giving us a standard. Our standard of life is the Lord Jesus. Why do we forgive our enemies? Because Jesus told us to love your enemies. Forgive those who despitefully use you. We have a standard. We have someone that we can look to to imitate. But who are we supposed to imitate here? In, in Dr. Peterson's words, who is our role model? There is no role model. So uh, again, you're just left with, okay, so well, how do I how do I navigate through these waters? I what is my what is my compass? I mean, every everyone gets in a ship or a boat, they they all have a compass, they need a they need a target, they need a, a reference point. What is the reference point here? We just don't hear it. So we are all in the depths of the pit. Um, yeah, and we can we, save people. We, we can go and save our dad in the pit of the, of, of the beast, of the dragon. Uh, again, um, the only one who delivered us, what the Bible says, that, that God has transferred us from the kingdom of darkness 
Colossians 1.13, into the kingdom of his dear son. So I couldn't save a soul if my life depended on it, Hatun. And I don't think if the Lord has used you to bring people to faith, you 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 cannot save a soul. I can't save a soul. Only God the Holy Spirit can convict the hearts of men and women and bring them to repentance. You and yeah. I, all we are are just instruments. Yeah, we're we are broken, just tools. We're broken, yeah, we're broken vessels. That's all we are. That God in his great mercy and his grace has used. He saw, he was pleased to use broken. Think of it this way, Hatun. It's like a brook, you know, you go to the forest, the woods, and there's a brook, a, a, a crooked stick. And you take the crooked stick and you make a straight line with it. Well, it's not the crooked stick that makes the straight line. It's the hand that holds it. So you and I are crooked sticks, but God uses us to bring about his purposes and his glory. Yeah. We, we, we cannot save any soul. We cannot make anyone better. Yeah. Why would Jesus have to come? If we could save ourselves, then why would Jesus have to come and die? What was the point of his incarnation, his perfect life, his sufferings on the cross, his resurrection? I mean, we had the Ten Commandments already. We had all the laws that God gave Moses, but those were not sufficient. No one can be saved by law. We need God's amazing grace. And that's why Jesus came looking for us, right? The Son of Man, he says, did not come. He said that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And I thank God that he found us. Yeah. And he came from up to down. Exactly. So we can go up with him. Yeah, as, as Jerome, Jerome, uh, Church Father Jerome once said that Christ came down to the very dung heap of existence because that's where he knew he would find us, in the dung heap. Yeah. Um, I think that was the kind of end of the video, um, brother. Yeah, have you heard anything? Have you heard Jesus? Have you heard the word Jesus or Jesus Christ? I didn't even hear the word God. Uh, the only time he used God is to to, to make some uh, expletive. Uh, but yeah. other than that, I didn't hear the word Jesus Christ once. Yeah, that's such a shame because this is the message to the church. It's supposed to be all about God, but he missed the point. <laughs> he missed the essential yeah. point. And we have good news. I mean, what does the word gospel mean? The word gospel means good news. So where was I, that gospel? Where did where did Dr. Peterson mention that wonderful good news? Not once. It's good that um, people feel confident that they can send message to church or they can point out some of the things are being missed. But in that, it needs to be essential. Essential is Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about Lord Jesus Christ. Exactly. We cannot save ourselves. Uh, we cannot save someone else. We cannot fix anyone. We cannot get ourselves fixed. It's exactly. all about Lord Jesus Christ who comes to the depths of the pit to take us up. He comes from up to take us up through his death and his resurrection that's right and as people who know that who knows that they are forgiven by the blood of lord jesus christ that affects all of our lives how we engage with climate how we deal with one another yeah because we are people who are forgiven who are silent by the love of lord jesus christ if that yeah. source is not there then everything is very much messed up and therefore, we live in a society, in a world, everything is messed up. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think what Dr. Peterson is doing is, you know, there's a fire and smoke, right? But what he's doing is he's, he's, he's getting rid of the smoke, but the fire is still there. And as long as fire is there, you're going to have more smoke. So you could blow away the smoke, but the, the source is still there. So you got to deal with the sin problem. By, by getting rid of some bad actions here and there, that's only temporary. We will always go back to doing evil, right? You know, the Bible says the dog returns to its vomit, the pig returns to the mud. And so unless that fire is extinguished, unless Christ removes the, the root of the problem, which is our sin, where Christ has to, where he atones for us, and until, he, until God goes in and takes the stony heart out and gives us a heart of flesh, we're going to still act the same. So we need a change. We need a radical change. But that radical change doesn't come from, you know, being a knight and going into the beast and then getting your father out of the belly of the beast. It involves a new creation, a new heart, and that only comes through Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, brother. Um, 
any other last comments would you like to add? First, I think, um, first of all, those of you who are in the chat and listening to us, um, it is important that we pray for um, Dr. Peterson, for him to know that he's forgiven by the blood of Lord Jesus Christ and pray that he will turn to him. Um, but um, have you got any kind of last comments which you like to add? Tony? Yeah, what I what I would say, Hatun, is, is that we need to be careful. Uh, I'll, I'll be doing a show in a couple of weeks dealing with the question of the, there's a lot of conservatives that we look up to. So we looked up to people like Jordan Peterson, Ben Shapiro. Uh, we look up to uh, people like even Dennis Prager from Prager University. Um, and uh, and others, uh, Viva Frey, and even even David Rubin, but we need to understand that even though they're conservatives, that the, they they don't have a biblical worldview. So I mean, Ben Shapiro is, is is Jewish, but he doesn't accept Jesus as the Messiah, as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and so that's going to affect his worldview. Um, and so while these men and women, conservative women while they can speak about conservative values and so forth, they only do so because of general revelation, because they've accepted general revelation. But we need to be very careful that we don't make them our champions uh, in our causes, because uh, they don't have a biblical worldview. Um, and that is a shortcoming that that they have. So we need to be very careful. We need we, It's bad enough we have pastor celebrity uh, status in 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 the church where we put pastors on on certain levels, we should never do that because it's a form of idolatry. So we need to be very very careful. Can we listen to Jordan Peterson? Yes, but always remember at the back of your head, he's not a, he's not a believer. He's not approaching this from a biblical worldview, and therefore everything he's going to say is going to be filtered through his own worldview, the lenses of his worldview. Always remember that God has. As our creator, God is the reference point. He defines us sexually, defines our identity. God defines what is good and evil because of his moral law. Um, God is the one who explains the meaning of life. God has shown us that, that he has not abandoned us. He sent his son into the world. There is life after death. There is a heaven to gain. There's a hell to shun. And so we just need to be careful that we don't become mesmerized with uh, voices like that of Peterson. As I said, Dr. Peterson believes in homosexual marriage, which is contrary to scripture. He believes that children can be raised in a, in a gay relationship, which is contrary to scripture. So let us just know where he is, understand where he is, but don't allow him to dictate the Christ, to your Christian conscience. We have God's word to do that. Yeah. So we don't, we take their critics um, criticism. We take what they are saying, but scripture overrules all. Of Anything course. which crushes, crushes with the scripture, scripture overrules all. We, yep. we get to see like uh, how Lord uses people outside of the church, outside of the body of the Christ to expose the sin which takes took place or takes place within the church. Mm -hmm. So we are mm -hmm. grateful for that. But none of those people are even our brothers and sisters, none of them are God. So we've got word of God to look up, word of God to obey. People will fail us. They will disappoint us. Therefore, we fix our eyes to the Lord Jesus Christ. He never disappoints us. He will never yeah. um, He will never uh, let us down. So focus right. your eyes on Lord Jesus Christ, who is there to fix you. <laughs> you are being yeah. fixed by his blood. Yeah, Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finish of our faith. So we need to keep our eyes on the target. Don't take your eyes off the target. Once you take your eyes off the target, you're going to get lost. You're going to lose your direction. So that's why we need to keep our eyes on Christ. Uh, pray for Dr. Peterson. Uh, there are times where he comes very close. He, he talks about the Bible being the foundation of Western society and, and so forth. So there are these moments where he's coming, coming, coming. Then he goes back, back, back. And so he's getting warmer, warmer. And then he goes colder, colder. Keep praying for him not just for Dr. Peterson, pray for Ben Shapiro. We're called to pray for all people. So um, let us continue to pray that they will come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the truth incarnate. Yeah. 
Thank you very much, brother. Um, thank you very much also for joining us as well. Um, we really appreciate your input and, and helping us to go through the video to critique and comment. Um, and thank you very much everyone who joined us in the chat, in the live stream. Um, we've got another live stream scheduled for tomorrow evening. By God's grace, we will see you there. Um, if that doesn't happen, we will see you at the bosom of the Father. Uh, once again, Tony, thank you very much for joining us. And I put the link in the description. Uh, please uh, check his channel, subscribe to his channel, and we will um, invite him again to go through deeper um, questions. Um, thank you very much. God bless you all. We will see you again.